you very much. Great to be here. Um, appreciate uh, all of you guys attending. And yeah, what I wanted to do is just kind of go through um, some uh, go-to-market tactics and strategies that I've used. And I'll be talking about I'll be talking about a number of products I've brought to market, but um, we'll really kind of use as a case study um, an online fundraising product that I brought to market. Um, I'm also involved right now in bringing a uh, an app. Uh, uh, for nonprofits to market and be following many, if not most of the things that we're working on right here that we'll talk through today. Um, a little bit about me is um, I am um, working currently with uh, Let's All Do Good. This is the mobile app um, that um, was mentioned. I also uh, run an online um, uh, uh, print business and, and uh, home goods business called Hull Speed Designs and I'm a score mentor here in Savannah. My background um, has been, I have been involved in uh, technology all of my career. I've really been on the sales, marketing, business development um, side of things. Product marketing has kind of been a big piece of it as well. And so in my roles, I've worked very closely with uh, the technology teams in terms of defining roadmaps, but then also making sure that we're um, bringing kind of all that hard work to market and making sure that it's uh, used by, by customers. And so what I wanted to do is talk through uh, what, um, what I have done using um, First Giving as a case study. This is a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fundraising platform for nonprofits. Um, a little bit of background just to sort of orient um, you guys in terms of what it was. If you've ever gotten an email from uh, a friend or family member saying, I'm you know, doing a 5K and I want you to support me. I'm running a marathon. I'm doing a polar plunge. I'm participating in a, in a dance marathon. These kinds of fundraising events where the individual volunteer or the supporter of the organization is actually putting themselves on the hook to go out there and raise money. And so this is a, a tool set that enabled these organizations that ran these kinds of events to uh, conduct a registration process for the event, to let people organize into teams, and to let individuals have a fundraising page where they could send it out, share it on social media, and raise money uh, for their participation in this event. And so uh, what I'll do is kind of talk through just some of the tactics that were used, um, and also just some of the strategies. And again, I'll try to keep it as tactical and practical as possible so that it's not, um, it's not too high level. Um, kind of what the snapshot looks like of how we did this and really just to, to, to sort of orient you. Um, so I, I was running uh, First Giving um, as a CEO. I really brought that company into the United States. There was a small UK um, uh, group that had already started. So we had some core technology that had been developed that had not been applied to the US market and we had no customers here. Um, over over time, um, we went from no nonprofits using it to over 3,000 nonprofits using it and uh, running at the rate of about $100 million per year in donations being kind of processed through the platform uh, for nonprofits. And so, you know, this is really kind of a reflection on uh, those early days. So, you, you got, you know, no, no customers. Where do you start? How do you start to gain traction? And kind of the you know, the three, as I kind of looked, look on, on this, it was just trying to number one, find that product market fit. And I'll get into each of these in, in some more detail. Um, and really just trying to understand um, what, what is going to be the right fit for this, for this market, what capabilities and so on. Um, then getting into the actual selling. Okay. So now we need customers and kind of how do we go about doing that going from the first few customers to lots more and then we layered on marketing after that. So a lot of times it's, you know, do I market then sell? Do I sell then market? I'll get into some of the details on this, but the approach we took, it was, it was definitely a sales oriented approach before we really kind of dove into the marketing piece of things. The first thing that we needed to focus on was just finding that product market fit. As I mentioned, we had a UK parent company uh, they had started to gain some traction working with the London Marathon um, as a way to get to fundraisers and, and get people to, to, to raise funds. So as we looked at how does this apply here in the United States, there were kind of four areas that we thought could be candidates. 
So one was nonprofit organizations, seems pretty obvious. The other one was events. Um, there's loads of marathons and events and things like that. And they had been working with the London Marathon and had seen some just incredible success there. So we felt like that was worth exploring. Um, corporate kind of social responsibility, working with some major organizations and getting their employees involved and helping them do good in the community. And then the, the, the last one was media companies who have great reach and they, they could have you know, their listeners or their viewers um, raise funds for any kind of nonprofit organization. So the place that we started was we talked to all of these and so kind of did a rapid core sample, if you will. Um, and we met with the Boston Marathon, Chicago Marathon, Rock and Roll Marathon, a lot of nonprofits. Um, I was in the Boston area at the time, and I forgot to mention, so I've, I've you know, been in Boston uh, most of my life and have been here in Savannah for the last couple of years. Uh, so we talked to the likes of Staples and just some of the other you know, major corporations um, in and around the Boston area. And we also talked to some of the major you know, radio stations and, and, uh, and, and TV stations. You know, we quickly discovered that nonprofits was the place for us to focus. It was a big repeatable market. The other ones had some interest, but um, it wasn't going to be a, a, a real market the way uh, the nonprofits would be where it was repeatable. Um, the things that we try to figure out is kind of what's the pain versus um, the gain and like where, you know, in talking to these individuals, we found that um, there's certainly some things like you can raise more money, um, certainly appealing. But there were other things like what is the pain that they're addressing for nonprofits? It was just the whole um, administrative aspects. And there was a lot of benefit to be had by just removing some of the hassles that come without an online version of this. Um, you know, ironically, um, it was over time, I find many of the nonprofits buying to remove pain rather than to add gain. You know, the raise more money was something that kind of played well and resonated, but it was also one of those things that when it actually came down to somebody making a buying decision, it was, I've got a headache and if you can help take it away, that was the, the thing. So I think very interesting in some of this core sampling, trying to really understand um, what it is people value in these different markets. Um, and then understanding the, 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 the benefit. And so it kind of ties back into um, you know, was it cost savings, time savings? Those were things that were really powerful versus the raise money. Everybody would sit there and nod their head, raise money. Yep, that's important. Which fundraiser isn't going to say that? But when it actually came to them pulling the trigger, it was really, un I think, important in our positioning to understand what the things, what the benefits were that really resonated with them, not just what they said. Um, when it comes to um, the focus for us, uh, there, there, there absolutely was um, a merit in each one of these areas. We could only attack one. And I think that's one of the things that I think is very important in all this. I think if we had said, well, we can, you know, approach all of these and then let's see what happens. I think from the early days, we decided we needed to focus on one. And that was going to be, um, it was going to help us build the product. It was going to help us sell the product, market the product, position the product. And while at a general level, the benefits and, and tool set was similar across all of these. If we had gone down the corporate social responsibility path versus the nonprofit path, we would have found, and I know this from, from you know, later on getting involved with corporate social responsibility, there's very different functionality sets that would have been required. So for us, it was very important to pick one. Um, and uh, it was really kind of find that tangible, repeatable value to customers where we could kind of do it again and again and again, very effectively. Um, the other piece for this was, um, was asking for money, asking for the order during this process. And I, I found that it was very easy to have happy conversations and a lot, there was a lot of nodding and, you know, corporations in particular and, and marathons. And one of the reasons that kind of led us towards, okay, maybe these aren't the right markets is, these race events, they're in the business of getting people to the starting line and getting them across the starting line safely and successfully. And they like to have charity tie-ins so they can close the streets and kind of look good in the community. Corporations similar, they, they you know, really do care about it, but they, you know, they, they have businesses to run, that's job number one. Charities, this is job number one. So you know, for us, when, we, you know, when I talked to Staples and said, so you know, would you be willing to come on board as a customer? sort of get that hesitation, whereas the nonprofits, there was definitely much more willingness there. So I think that's a very important step 
as you're kind of testing the markets. To really ask for that order because you're going to find out very quickly if they're just, you know, smiling and kind of, you know, you know, want to have a pleasant meeting and, and then get out of the room. Uh, so we did select nonprofits as the focus. Um, we ignored the rest only, only for um, the time being. And then from there, we proceeded to dig into the nonprofit market uh, kind of very deeply. Um, you know, what we found is the nonprofit, there's 1.5 million nonprofits in the United States. Um, and our target was not all of them. So, and it was important to understand that. And I think we kind of understood that at the beginning, but it wasn't until we just started talking to as many nonprofits as we possibly could to really zero in on what was the right size. And I'll kind of get into this in a couple of slides, kind of finding that ideal customer profile. But to, to really understand what the messaging and positioning was at a very high level, you know, the what it, what, what it does versus how it works. Um, I think that this is sometimes where I think a technical founder can, um, can struggle a little bit or might be a bit of a blind spot, not struggle so much. Um, we certainly saw this in a small group where we had built a lot of really amazing functionality into the platform. And when we started to go out and sell it and position it, like easy was the feature that people wanted. And so we were positioning this as, as simple um, relative to other things that were out there. We had a customer base that wasn't really technically adept um, the way other markets might be. And so simple, easy, what were really important benefits. And it was funny to see some of the tensions that emerged between the sales team and the technical team where I was like, this stuff is like, why don't you tell them about all the incredible functionality we've got? And you kind of get there in the presentation, but um, it was really understanding and helping our customers understand the, the what it does. And then also understand from their perspective, you know, what, 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 what is going to resonate. So we, we looked at the kind of what category was it in um, and really helped them try to frame it. And for us, it was um, online peer to peer fundraising. There's other kinds of fundraising, online fundraising, but really trying to help them understand what it was. Um, we focused a tremendous amount on the use cases. So specifically, if you do this, this is, this is um, somebody that we can help and this is how we help them. And we really kind of broke it down to very simple and understandable terms. Um, and also kind of looked at the, you know, again, analyzing what is that benefit back to that first slide. Um, you know, the which one is yours? This was, I think, a very important piece for us because as we waded into the market, we didn't necessarily know what we were going to compete on or what we could compete on. And so uh, there were other competitors in the market, um, which is a good sign, that were way more funded, had way more functionality, had way bigger development staffs than ours. And they had built some, you know, incredible capability. It was pretty complicated, though. It was expensive. It was uh, kind of overkill um, in a lot of cases. And with the nonprofit market for us, you know, we really kind of came along and said, we can give you the same kind of capabilities, but we can give it to you at a price point that makes different, that, that makes um, sense for a smaller organization. And it's also super easy. So you don't, if you don't have a technical staff, if it's just you. And so for us, it was really trying to understand where that gap was in the market. And it was through these um, very detailed conversations that we kind of understood where our strengths were relative to our, our, uh, our competitors. And so we chose the things that we were going to compete upon. And um, so that which one is yours, you know, okay, so if you're an online peer to peer fundraising company, great, help me figure out which one um, you're involved with. I later on was involved with one that, you know, wasn't easy or wasn't competing on easy or inexpensive, it was much more configurable. And we just, you know, you compete after a different segment of the market. Um, something that we kind of boiled down um, in the blue box below is, you know, we're, we're, we're launching this product and we're looking to learn more about the needs of the market and get some honest feedback. Could you, could you provide us some guidance? When we were early days trying to kind of understand where we fit in the market, um, this was a, a, an important tactic for how we got in front of a lot of nonprofits. It, it wasn't as threatening as maybe a sales demo would be because um, people sort of have their guard up. People always want to give you guidance and, you know, are, especially in this industry, we're, we're happy to give you feedback. It turned into a sales conversation, no question about it. Um, but uh, that was, a, I think, a very important tip. And we got in front of a lot of organizations 
some of whom we knew right away wasn't a good fit for us, but it really helped us determine who was a good fit for us. Um, so we boiled it down to something like this. And again, just kind of trying to, you know, be a little bit tactical here. Um, you know, we put something together, which was easy and digestible. And it's just, you know, our company was at first giving was an online fundraising platform that enables your fundraisers to register form teams and do more like, you know, again, what it does, not how it works. And so, so what, um, you know, it's easy and it's priced so that they, so that, you know, when you succeed, we succeed. And it was really kind of this high level positioning that, you know, when you've got um, only a soundbite or when the market is trying to understand where you fit and when they might need you, it was going through the exercise and think of trying to boil things down. <clears throat> this was kind of an entree for the sales um, team. And, and um, this is something that really came out of the sales team, I think is another important point. Um, I, I said in the earlier on, the progression was sales and then into marketing. I've seen situations where the marketing team comes up with um, the messaging and the positioning based upon some limited information and kind of exposure to the market. And then they arm the sales team to go out there and ho hopefully it works. Whereas with a sales um, forward approach, you know, the sales team is going to come back and they're going to tell you exactly when the light bulbs go off, when the eyes light up and when somebody says, yes, I'm in. Um, and so for us, you know, kind of this kind of structure was heavily influenced by those initial sales calls rather than, you know, something that marketing went away and, and put together and then handed to sales. And I think that that's, um, I, I feel like that's a very important distinction in this because I've also been involved in those scenarios where marketing kind of prepares it and it's, it's kind of directionally right, but you're not necessarily understanding when those light bulbs go off. Um, you know, big customers versus markets. I think this is just another thing in the progression of launching these products that we had to make some decisions about and, and we had to be intentional about it. Um, you know, early on we had some major, um, you know, like the marathon, um, that we could have worked with, but we looked at that and said, well, there's not that many others that would do this. I mean, there's, there's some, um, definitely, um, there's a handful, but there's not necessarily, you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of organizations um, that could potentially work with us. Um, we also got some very large um, nonprofits like a World Vision. But then over on the other side, where the company really gained traction and success was with smaller chapter-based organizations. And I've got this, um, this Guardian Angel Basset Hound Rescue. It's just kind of one of the examples where um, you know, trying to distinguish who the bellwethers are versus who are the frustrated product, man product managers. And I think that's a distinction that we've seen um, pretty regularly where people will come back to you and say, could you add this? Could you add that? Sometimes it's good ideas. Sometimes it's not. And um, in the case of Guardian Angel, there was a, an executive director there who um, was either, he was either crackpot or bellwether. <laughs> and uh, it was hard to know at the time. And decided, you know, this guy could, I think he really was a bellwether. It was a little bit of a roll of the dice, but, you know, he was somebody who said, listen, if, if you can help my, my Basset Hound um, dog walk, we raised $20,000 to success. <clears throat> I'm the, he was kind of the ringleader of like 50 other Basset Hound rescue leagues. I was like, are you kidding me? There's 50 other Basset Hound rescue leagues? And it's like, yep. So sure enough, you know, we made a couple of tweaks based upon that guidance. And he probably brought about 30 of them onto the platform. You know, so I think that as you're getting going, you're going you're gonna to encounter um, individuals and organizations that are making requests of you. And I think that here is where having kind of an ethos in the product and trying to understand who those bellwethers are, were was, was very important. We had World Vision, a very a great uh, customer, big, um, and they were trying to um, take our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising and really kind of adapted to their sponsor a child model. And, and it was very tempting to follow them down that path. But then it was one of those things where, you know, there's not that many people that really kind of do, do that kind of model, whereas there was just, you know, tens of thousands literally that do the peer to peer. And so, you know, there were some times there where we really had to kind of follow what we were um, thinking about or really kind of tested what that ethos and what that kind of product lens was. And I, I, I 
don't mean to suggest that we had all of that stuff nailed beforehand. We definitely didn't, but it was times like that that you really had to say, listen, you know, does it make strategic sense, even though it's nice to say yes to world vision and follow them down this path, where does that take us? And so I think it was um, in, in the go to market, I think that every organization is going to encounter some of those decisions and, and which I'm a huge believer in following the customers that are going to lead you there. But it's also being, I think, very intentional about which ones you follow. Um, and we were really in the camp, and I, I still think this is an important rule of thumb, is um, build the product so that you're going to be addressing markets, not just single customers, which isn't to say don't follow your customers because you should. But just in some cases, you know, you might build a, an awesome feature set for one single big customer. Um, the next thing we did is we really looked at like customer sets and we tried to grow from like uh, customer sets. So um, we were based in Boston and we just started um, trying to own the Boston, uh, the Boston nonprofit community for this, this subset of products. And so we you know, worked with a lot of um, local nonprofit organizations and it was great because we could say, hey, Mass General Hospital uses us, which helped us get Brigham and Women's Hospital, which helped us get you know, some other organization, and they all kind of knew each other. We did the same thing with Special Olympics, where um, there definitely was a, a use case there. As soon as we got one, two, three, five, it was easy to get 10, 20, 30, because they all kind of would look at each other. And so I think that in the markets that you're in, the degree to which you can either leverage geography um, or kind of like organizations like akin to a Special Olympics, or if there's other similarities, I find that's a great way to get validation and then to, and then to kind of gain further traction. And so we did this core sampling and, you know, one, you know, we would just kind of test lists. We'd have a couple of the salespeople just call into these and find out, okay, where are the veins of ore? And, you know, I had some sales guys, you know, come back and say, this list stinks, give me another one. And great. Okay. I don't want you spending time on a, on a list where there's just nothing there. And so we really kind of discovered kind of where those clusters were. So I think this is, um, this was a bit of an inflection point for us where we said, okay, now what do we do? And we really kind of took the approach that um, we could draw a circle around these kinds of organizations that were very good fits for our organization. And we, um, we went out and we, we generated lists. You know, other alternatives would have been, we could have said, okay, let's go out and, you know, write content and then hopefully we attract them and then hopefully they come to our website and then hopefully they fill out a, a, a conversion form and now we'll call them. So we sort of cut out the middleman in this scenario and just said, we're going to go get a list of every Special Olympics, every American lung, American cancer, diabetes, right, you know, right down the list of kind of where we knew there was tight fits. So we went out and we created the lists um, ourselves and... I think this is um, you know, something that I'll, I'll talk about um, in just a moment, but I think it's something that I think can be very broadly applied in a B2B um, type of environment. Um, as, as part of this path, we really zeroed in on what we called our ideal customer profile. You know, so we, you know, with 1.5 million nonprofits out there, they were definitely not all for us and we were not right for them. I want to say there were somewhere between 50 and 100,000 organizations that we were really the right fit for, which is a big market, but it also helps you realize that you don't need to, uh, you know, appeal to, um, you know, the other 1.4 million nonprofits. And so the gray box on the left, the way we went about this is we understood exactly what use cases were kind of prerequisites for them to even care about us. Um, and if they didn't have those, if they didn't, if they weren't running a peer to peer event, it was on to the next. And I think that was, um, so that was kind of one bar. We really started to understand what verticals they were in, because if you think about nonprofits, there's, you've got everything from museums to zoos, to schools, to hospitals, to health organizations. There's basically 24 categories of, of nonprofit organizations. And in some of the markets that you're looking at, really trying to understand you know, which are the right verticals that are, are the best fit. Um, we also discovered, you know, from a size perspective, as we were kind of looking at, um, you know, the easy, the templatized, you know, we basically said, we're not going to address the 100 million nonprofit organization. I mean, we had some of those, 
but that wasn't our, our sweet spot. And then really kind of dialed in, you know, like what makes us different? Why do they say yes to us? And then who that person was. So, you know, what we would look at is we said, okay, um, you know, we're on the right hand side, the different examples of how we kind of defined what that, um, what that ideal customer profile looked like. And this was a very important step, not only in the beginning, but also as we scaled, because this really defined um, who sales went after, who we marketed to, um, who we built the product for, like this went upstream to the roadmap. And this kind of went into those conversations about, do we build out to sponsor a child or do we kind of keep going, you know, after. So it, it even talked about, um, uh, you know, customer retention and customer support and things like that. You know, there were some customers that would churn out if they weren't an ideal customer profile. We wouldn't get as concerned as if they were. You know, we'd kind of ask the question, why did we lose that, that ICP customer? So uh, just to fast forward a little bit, and this is, um, you know, over a little bit of time, this is kind of what that ICP kind of drove us towards, where you'll see what I'm talking about here, all the different verticals, you know, kind of across the top, and then the different sizes um, kind of down the left-hand margin. I know you can't really see all that well, but it really, um, there were four uh, different verticals of nonprofits that were our focal point, that were, had the best fit for us. And we also kind of looked at what the right size was. So for us, it was under $5 million and it was above $100,000 in operating um, budget. There's a lot of um, small organizations, less than $100,000, but they're new, they're, um, you know, they come, they go, and they weren't necessarily the right fit. So that's kind of how we, how we try to structure it. And it does not mean that you ignore the others or you don't, you know, do business with them. You absolutely did. Um, but those, um, and basically what you're looking at here, the green areas are the, are the density in terms of number of customers in each of the verticals and each of the sizes to really see how kind of these things um, tended to cluster. And I think it was, it was largely because we had defined that ideal customer profile and were deliberate about who we went after. So coming back to this building the lists, um, list mining was something that, you know, we did as a bit of a shortcut in this and just kind of walking through what this looks like. So take, uh, for example, Special Olympics or um, cancer walks or AIDS rides or, you know, any of the things where there is a, um, a need, a peer-to-peer, -peer, there's a fundraising need, um, you know, even um, competitor lists. Um, and I think that where the light bulb went off here is, you know, one of our sales reps said, you know, I want to call all of, this, all of these um, Special Olympics because I think that they were a really good fit for us. And he's like, so I'm going to take the next two weeks and I'm going to, you know, kind of spend time kind of getting them all into our database. And I was like, I love the idea. I love the kind of the nose for this, but like, why don't we just shortcut it? So basically what we did is we took and we consolidated the process to get that list and we offshored it. So we basically worked with, um, with, with an offshore team that, you know, I, I work with today and, and kind of do a lot of this work with, but it's, here's the list that we need. Um, we defined um, the exact list, whether it's directories or advanced Google searches or conference lists. And we let them do kind of the heavy lifting in terms of that, you know, kind of getting us um, the information that we needed to put into our, our, our database. So uh, just from a practical perspective, uh, you know, what I, what I would do is I would literally walk through, okay, so if this is the Special Olympics list, like the exact clicks, you click, you know, on the, on the, the state chapters, you kind of go in, you get all of the, um, all of the, the information. Once we had a database back, we would say, get us 50 records, please. Let us just check if our accuracy, then go get all the records. Um, we would send out an email to the group, um, basically an introduction email with a clear opt out. And it would basically be, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were on the right side of any sort of canned spam um, issues. So we would say, here's what we're doing. You know, this is what we do. We're sending you this email because we know that you do peer to peer events and we'd love to stay in touch with you and show you what we do. If you don't want to hear from us, um, just click this opt out button and we'll take you off of our list. So we got very, very few opt outs and we got even fewer spam um, complaints, like almost, no, almost nothing, which was, a, it just shows that it's targeted. So with that, we really fed these in and this became the basis of um, how we went out to market um, our sales lists, our, our, our database marketing. And um, just to give you an idea of what this looked like across the top, would literally give them a PowerPoint of 
we want you to go here. Here's the screens that you're going to see. Here's the buttons we want you to click. And then down below, here's the spreadsheet that we would like you to populate with the information. So what this did is it really accelerated and was incredibly inexpensive to kind of populate your database with a very high density of high probability uh, uh, prospects. Uh, and as we get into some of the other marketing tactics that we've used where it's, you know, an inbound content marketing, which there's definitely a place for that, um, where you can really draw a tight circle around your prospect set. I'm a big believer in going and getting that list, finding creative ways to get that list so that you can go out and start addressing them. As you get into the sales funnel, there's, I think that starting out, and I think this is something from a founder's perspective. It's uh, how do you start thinking about the people in this database now? And especially if you have a, a salesperson, how do you keep your finger on the pulse of um, what, what is the activity that they're doing? Uh, are they making progress? What does my pipeline start to look like? So we really built out kind of a seven stage um, or six stage rather, um, uh, kind of funnel where you've got your prospects and you've got people making, you know, X calls a day. These are not people in the pipeline. Um, once a contact is made and there's some level of qualification that takes place, um, they become opportunities in the pipeline at, at, at 10%. Um, we, we only scored them at 10% because a lot of times these are happy conversations and they're, they're not really prospects. And they don't really develop through. And then just quickly, we had a demo stage. We kind of bumped them up to 50%. If there was intent, if after the demos, it was clear that, um, yep, we are going to be making a decision. We have budget for it. Here's the timeline. It's you and four others. Give us your pricing, please. Um, okay, there's a, a decision that will be made. We're a contender, and we would uh, bump it up to 75% probability in the pipeline. And then when they came back to us and said, hey, we've selected you. Let's start working through the contract. We bump it up. And then at that stage, you either it closes or, or you lose it. And it's, and, and that's, and that's the progression. I think as you know, founders or technical founders, as you start to bring on sales people, this is an important framework, I think, to help make sure all the sales team has a common vernacular for how they're working through prospects. And it also gives you real visibility into uh, the progress that they're making. And I think that, you know, very often it's like, Hey, I made uh, 50 calls today great but what's happening with the pipeline are they the right 50 calls and um, i think this is kind of a way to help manage that uh, some of the tools that we use again definitely not all to start but as we scaled and and kind of is you know in, in some of the things i'm putting in place right now for the, the product launch that i'm involved with right now this is kind of a lineup of the sales and marketing stack um, so we have a CRM, of course, um, Salesforce and HubSpot are the two that I've, I'm most familiar with. Uh, uh, we would also have a marketing uh, automation uh, uh, software, whether it's HubSpot, Marketing Cloud, Pardot, or some of the ones that I've used. Uh, lead scoring, I'll just kind of move through these kind of fast. We have uh, AppQs, which is for in-product messaging. Uh, Drift, I'll skip down to that one. That is for setting up meetings on the site. That's where the best sales leads came from, um, and the sales team was tripping over themselves to follow up on the drift leads because they were very kind of engaged leads. And then um, you know, also prospecting tools like HubSpot sales to help the reps kind of get out and, um, and Zoom. You know, just one note on the HubSpot sales, it basically lets each of the sales reps send out their own personalized campaigns. Think of them almost more as sales campaigns than marketing campaigns. But what it lets you do, or what it let them do, is know who to call. You know, they send out 500 emails to a hospital foundation all hospital foundations. And so you're not going to call all 500 of them, at least not this week. But what they do is they will call the 15 people who opened it three times or who forwarded it or who clicked the link in it. Those are the people who are engaged. They're demonstrating engagement. And that's how the sales team really helped to zero in on who those, uh, who those individuals were that were most likely to uh, to be uh, uh, interested in talking right now about this. On the marketing KPI side of things, again, just trying to um, you know, balance off some of the marketing pieces of this. And I haven't spent a lot of time on the marketing side of things, but just to touch on it, uh, there's so many, so much marketing information that comes out of these systems that it, it, it got, it gets overwhelming pretty fast, you know, even in an early stage. 
the things that we always, um, or after time started to look at, it's just like, what's working, what isn't? Like, where, where would we spend more money? And so trying to boil it down to what were the, the, the channels? And by channels, I mean, website, advertising, conferences, you know, email marketing. So the, the big categories of marketing efforts, as opposed to which white paper or which webinar or which particular conference, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you know, we looked at the, the lead sources versus the opportunity sources over on the right hand side, coming kind of the lower there. And it was very revealing in terms of where, you know, what were the marketing channels that were actually driving revenue. And, you know, kind of in the upper right, we would, we would look at um, kind of the, the, the lead sources by um, pipeline contribution. So what was actually filling up the pipeline and then what was actually generating bookings in the right. And so um, I guess the kind of the message here is that as you likely get into, you know, how do you track all of these things, uh, it's, pretty easy to get overwhelmed with all of the different detailed levels of data. And I found that just kind of zooming out a little bit to understand which areas were the things that you should be investing in was at least the right place to start. Um, and I guess the other kind of message here is it's, um, as you scale a marketing spend, it's really easy to spend the marketing money and it's not as easy to see the corresponding uh, revenue growth. And I've just seen that time and time again, it sounds kind of obvious, but we are in the moment saying, okay, how do we take sales from this level to this level? Um, you know, I think that doing it slowly rather than kind of, um, incurring big marketing spends, because a lot of times you're going to, you're going to, uh, take some lumps and, and, and get some learning about what actually works and, and what doesn't. Um, really just in wrapping up, um, just some observations on the sales side and any of you who are involved with kind of growing the sales part of what you're doing or starting the sales element of what you're doing. Just some things that I found kind of, uh, you know, throughout the experiences I've had um, building a sales function. I think that if you can early on, you know, find a really solid sales rep or two, um, if money permits, that's a great way to get started. Um, and it's harder than you think. It's finding people that have the nose for the revenue and not people who are diligent about, I made 50 calls today. Because the 50 calls today, you know, I'd rather have somebody comes back and I've had this happen. Somebody comes back and says, you know, this list stinks. Give me a better list. Uh, or, you know, or let's call these guys even better yet. Um, rather than somebody comes back and says, I made 50 calls and nobody was interested. Um, BDRs. Um, so once you get a sales rep who's really um, kind of proven themselves, I have found that hiring uh, a BDR or a business development rep, this is kind of a junior salesperson who can go through and do qualifications. They can set up meetings. They can kind of fire through these lists, you know, the list mining lists that I mentioned, and they can tee things up for that, that sales rep. That's a really great spend I have typically found where um, you'll, you'll see a, a very high correlation in terms of return for a hire like that. And then once you have those two working together, then you would bring on um, other sales. So first get a good salesperson. Once they've proven themselves, get a BDR to help make them even better and then, and then grow from there. Um, yeah, finding those salespeople with uh, you know, a nose for the revenue versus diligence to process, um, it's really hard to do. And, but that's always, always one where, um, it, it, it's easy to be fooled, especially during the, uh, the initial processes. Um, uh, the sales don't educate. Um, this just, if you're going into a new market or I always found, you know, sometimes you have a salesperson on an hour long call trying to convince somebody that they should be giving the time of day to online donations. And, you know, what we learned early on is we are not there to win every battle. We are there to find the people who are ready. And it's a fine distinction and there's certainly source of pride there. So I say um, don't educate with, a, with a, an, a, a big old asterisk next to it, but it is find the people who are ready to buy, who get it. If there's fundamentals that you need to, you know, um, you know kind of convince people of, more often than not, I found it's better to move on to the next and spend your time elsewhere. Um, and, um, I've, I made the point earlier, I think sales should have a very strong influence early on in terms of the messaging and positioning because they're the ones who are seeing the eyes light up or the, or the frowns or the whatever it is to really appreciate what resonates and what doesn't. 
um, from a KPI perspective for sales reps, it's opportunities created, it's what does their pipeline look like, what is their monthly bookings or quarterly bookings, and then what's the revenue that they're generating. And there's all kinds of other things, like here's how many demos, or here's how many calls, or here's how many emails that got sent out. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the, those four KPIs, I think, are the ones that, that if you track those, and I've seen situations where, you know, the manager comes down and says, okay, you need to make 50 calls a day. You'll get 50 calls a day, um, but you may not get the rest of the things here. Whereas if you kind of say, listen, you know, um, you know, make the, I don't care how many calls a day you make, as long as you're hitting, growing your pipeline, hitting bookings and revenue numbers. And then, um, skip down to inertia. That's a tough competitor. A lot of times don't take it. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, don't underestimate it. Um, trying to find ways to create sense of urgency. Um, in what we were selling with first giving, we had the luxury of there was an event, there was an event date, people had to make a, uh, a decision based upon that date. Um, it's very easy for people to say, especially if, if it's a uh, pain versus gain, people will defer um, a gain say, I'll oh, we'll do the same thing for another year. And let's talk in a, in a year. Um, uh, people are much more likely to jump for pain, I have found, but trying to create that sense of urgency. Um, and you know, that's really it. I, I appreciate it. I've covered a lot and um, want to make sure that there's some time for questions um, in all this, which there's probably going to be quite a few. So I just want to leave it there. And um, if there's things that you've got questions on that I covered or things that I didn't cover that you have questions about, would love to, to talk through them. Thank you, Mark. That was, that was really good. Um, I have questions, but I was kind of waiting to see if, um, if anyone else did. Check in the chat window. Nothing in the chat window. Does anyone um, have any questions they'd like to ask? Um, I don't have any questions. Just, uh, just thanks for the talk. I appreciate it. A lot of good information. Thanks, Austin. Um, it looks like we lost a couple as well. Um, yeah, I was, I thought in the, in the first part, it was really interesting. Um, I don't think everyone had, was there in the beginning when you were talking about, um, when you were talking about initially narrowing it down and trying to figure out kind of like the, the pain versus the gain. Yep. Um, whenever you were, whenever you were talking to people about that, what was, what were some of the specific questions that you're at? Like what, how did you actually elicit that information? Like it's, it's, it's hard to dig into that and really um, to get people's real feelings on the pain versus the gain. Like what, what kinds of questions would you ask in order to elicit the response that would give you the, the right answer about, between those? Um, it was, you're right. It was, it was definitely some digging, you know, the conversation would start with, Oh, we, we help you raise more money and everybody it's kind of like, yeah, mother heard apple pie. Everybody, everybody would kind of rally around that. It was as you got into the discussions that you'd find out. And as, as you had people say, you know, could you walk me through what is it, what is it, what is it like it is as they started to take you through what they do now and really turning the floor over to them a little bit, that's maybe when you would uncover some of the issues. Um, as we learned what those issues were, for us, um, there, were, it were, there were challenges around kind of the registration process, not always the easiest, forming teams. There was like um, day of event reporting was kind of a nightmare. You know, so we sort of figured out kind of where the, where the, the pain points were through this. We could prompt some of those. We could start to, um, but um, it was really through digging it. And I think in a lot of ways it was through face-to-face -face type phone call, face-to-face uh, uh, -face type meetings or very detailed, um, uh, not necessarily sales meetings, but it was back to the, you know, could you give us guidance on this? And I found that in that scenario, they were much more open to say, you know, this is a pain in the butt because we do this and this. And they're, they're really in a position where you're saying, hey, you're the expert. Could you kind of help us? And they'll kind of be very forthcoming where when it was, hey, I want to show you a sales demo, it was much more of a one-sided conversation. And you definitely did not get that, um, that input quite the same way. Okay, cool. Thanks. And I, I see Mark um, posted a question in the chat. Um, let me see if I can find that. 
I can read it. Too. Oh, good. Yeah, thanks. Do you have that? Yep. It says, uh, describe First Giving's relationship with the Panorama fundraising platform. And then the second one after that is, why does the prospect work with First Giving first directly with Panorama? Uh, so uh, First Giving was acquired by Frontstream. And it was brought into um, a, a, a larger platform called Panorama. And so that's kind of phase two of um, you know the life cycle of, of front stream of first giving. It was uh, it was a company that was acquired, and uh, Panorama. There's a Panorama Global Fund, which is kind of the processing entity that sits behind um, first giving. I think I actually have a question. If that's all right, yeah. Did you? start out as a software developer then move on to like kind of doing your own product or did you um what was the process with that yeah uh definitely not a software developer no um so early on so i've been um working in technology companies really all my career on the sales marketing um product product marketing product management side of things so um no i um have have kind of been part of these efforts very much from that perspective and so uh you know some some thoughts on there is it was funny i met um i met Yvonne kind of and i had, had had an intention when i moved to savannah to kind of get to know this group more and just kind of what the tech scene was going on here and sort of felt a little sheepish she's like well i'm not really a developer i don't know if that's a good if it's right but it's uh, i'm glad that she sort of talked me into it because you know there is a lot of great back and forth um from, from that perspective, um, I guess just one other point on that is I found it super helpful to put the product and support and salespeople together early on, uh, because there's there's nothing like somebody on the on the product or the development team like hearing a, a sales call or a support call gone wrong, and they can be like, oh, I know how to fix that. Um, so I don't know if that probably wasn't your question, but no, my background is not in develop as a developer. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm just going to put in my two cents. I work with a lot of technical founders and in for two startups, I've been the first um, non-technical hire. And to me, like Mark's presentation, I wish that every technical founder could see that to kind of, you have to know where you're going. Um, even in the beginning when you're building the product and who you're building it for and, and deciding on, you know, what your path to market is looking, is going to look like or should look like. Uh, because it influences a lot of those early decisions that you make in, in building a product. So just, just to me to tie that back to like why a software developer would need, would need this. Yeah. I mean, I mean, one of the things that I, uh, in, just on that point itself, there's, there's that kind of uh, what does, what, re, what respond, what, how does the market respond? And I just remember, um, you know, kind of going back to our salespeople being like, it's, it's the easy, it's the this, and like the sales demos were at a very high level. It was really at the what it does, not how it works level. And a lot of times, depending on the nature of the product you're selling and who you're selling it to, the getting into the how it works detail can be overwhelming to prospects. And it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, in, 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 Kind of the experience that I had. Sometimes the, the the folks on the on the technical side of things would feel like, boy, why don't we talk up more of the incredible stuff that we've done more effectively when there's kind of these two sides of the brain that I think need to work very well, for, very well, and very closely together. Awesome. Um, a couple. Another question from Mark. I don't know if you you can see this on the chat. It says, uh, "Are your sales rep?" representatives, employees, or independent sales representatives, how do you compensate your sales representatives? Sales reps in these cases were all employees and it was a base plus a commission. And I could get into the, you know, the details if you would, would want to take that offline if there's specific questions. But, you know, what I found is that, you know, especially early on, there's not really a, uh, you know, it's not like here's what we know comes out of this territory and uh, it's all brand new. So you, you may find yourself in the position of having to pay somebody a fairly state solid salary, but then make sure that there's a commission component of it as well. Um, or even if it's a bonus type uh, scenario as well, based upon performance. And it's striking that balance between making sure while they're getting going that they're, um, they're comfortable, um, but not too comfortable. Mm -hmm. 
follow on to that, Mark, is um, did you ever consider 100% uh, commission sales? Uh, not for what we were doing. I think that may have been where we would have, if we had gone that route, we, we probably would have considered um, like third party contractors potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and just in, in our scenario, at least with software, it just, we, and, and in the Boston area, um, we wouldn't have been competitive for, for our product set for what we were looking for. Okay. Um, question about the lead generation. You said you outsourced that to a group that uh, produced leads for you. How did you discover them? Um, a little bit of trial and error. Um, the group I used is based out of India. I think I found them online and just kind of went project by project. And um, I, I use them today and they've just kind of been, you know, we really kind of get, get, have gotten in rhythm around this. So um, it's been, I guess I, I would almost call them, they, they, they uh, put together a list of prospects, they put together a list of suspects, but we define um, exactly what we want them to go get, you know, so we want to get this, you know, list of, of all the Susan G. Comans because we know that they run a, an event that is a perfect fit for these tools. So we want them to know about us. We want to start building a relationship with them. Um, and so it's a very direct line to those. So, so the, to the degree mark that you, you know, have like these defined groups of, of organizations or individuals or, you know, as I understand a little bit about your business, you know, people that maybe have equipment or space that would be excess capacity, like how do you, could you draw a circle around those kinds of individuals and rather than, or in addition to, not rather than, let's say advertising to them, do you just create a list? Like if that list were magically to appear in your CRM, how do you make that happen? So that was really kind of the, the, the mindset that we had in terms of trying to put this together. Because then it's, you know, we found, a, a you know, the, the email marketing from a cost to results perspective was probably one of our number one um, lead generation tools. So you, you get them into a nurture flow, you have the sales team call them. And it was just, it was building that database that became very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a book that uh, Yvonne has recommended called Traction. I'm not sure if you've read it by uh, Weinberg and Mares. In that they describe 19 traction channels and it's difficult to spread yourself too thin uh, in going after every one of those. What they suggest is you focus on two or three of those for a few months and then determine what's working, retain the ones, the channels that work, and then move on to the others. Is that the approach that you took in determining what marketing channels to try and which ones to double down on? Yeah, I mean, we kind of, we, we did that, um, you know, we took that approach when it was, okay, do we go after nonprofits, corporations, media companies, um, or, or events? And we, we crammed all that into about six weeks to say, okay, you know, which one of these is the one that we need to kind of put our chips down on? We also did the same sort of thing as we went out to nonprofits. So once we decided, okay, it's nonprofits, it's like, the, you know, talked to museums and aquariums and schools. And we discovered that a lot of those were not the right fit. So we, we, I would say in probably about another four weeks, we discovered, okay, this is really where we're zeroing in. And then, um, you know, I'd like to say on the marketing side, I think we were slower. Um, we had, uh, I, in some ways I found having a smaller marketing budget to, to be better in the sense that I, I was pretty confident in the early days that the marketing money we were spending was actually doing things that were important and were ge generating revenue is I've had times when it, you, you get funding and say, okay, so let's double or triple the marketing budget from, you know, 100,000 to 300,000 or from, you know, 10,000 to 30,000. Those jumps are always harder. I find to kind of uh, manage in terms of the return. And, you know, in particular, you know, one lever is like, let's go out and let's do some advertising. So we've, and I meant to talk a little bit about this, tested um, Facebook advertising, LinkedIn advertising, Google AdWords, and then advertising with just some industry um, you know, publications. Industry publications was, was number one in terms of ROI and results because it was such a targeted focus. We weren't getting as many leads as we were out of Google AdWords, but for us, 
for our scenario, we didn't find that we were getting the right quality of people coming through Google AdWords. So we wound up spending a ton of money. And, and, and when you look at it from like, okay, we had, lead gen, we had lead generation numbers. It's like, hey, we're hitting our lead generation numbers, right? And thanks to Google, we're hitting our lead gen numbers. And then when you look at how those matriculate to market qualified leads, big step down, opportunities created, huge step down, you know, what, what actually turns into bookings, another huge step down. So, and then when it turned into booking, it was almost like zero. So, you know, with some of those, and is it because we didn't quite crack the code? I, I think we, we, we put enough energy against those that I think it wasn't that it couldn't be done. It was just, we discovered that the money that we were spending was better spent elsewhere. So on the marketing tools side, I think that you can very quickly iterate on like which advertising is going to be good for you pretty fast, I think. Um, other things like, you know, conferences or other channels like that, that's the, that definitely takes a little longer. Or were, were there any specific marketing um, channels that you had questions about or just more generally? Well, there's certainly a broad range of uh, channels to, uh, to, to choose from. Um, public relations, uh, advertising, uh, both uh, internal and external advertising, uh, you mentioned um, publications, certain publications you advertised in. Yeah. I think the publications that we didn't, I didn't do much print. Uh, everything I did, I wanted to be able to track back to what it was generating. And so I, we were literally like, um, what, what channels generated pipeline? What channels generated bookings? And so um, we did not do much with PR in our scenario. Um, we just had a, a, a minor retainer to kind of take care of the, you know, the, the fundamentals of a, of a press release here or there, but it was really not much of what we did. Um, we didn't do any at print advertising uh, because we just couldn't track it. And so the advertising I talked about that was industry specific was all website or dedicated emails and things like that where we could track it. Mm -hmm. Search engine um, optimization. SEO was something that we, so that kind of got lumped under our website. You might've seen that there was a website category. And yes. so that was something that we did invest in. I think that we probably found that the biggest bang for our buck was some of the tweaks that we made with a contractor over the first 60 to 90 days. And then I think you see diminishing returns on that because they, 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 they make all the things. I think um, part of it was just how we structured our pages, the content, and then how much we were doing in terms of ongoing content generation. And that was um, something that was important, but it was definitely a slower build. And it's not quite the same direct line between cost, energy, and revenue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I guess I had a general question, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Kind of switching careers to, like, software engineering. Yep. And I do have interest in, like, creating a product but for the time being I probably will avoid that I was just wondering like a few years down the road once I get more experience what would you recommend to someone like me who is more on the technical side but has an interest in that possibly so an interest in uh, what becoming a founder or in I mean, possibly but I'm not sure just like yeah just to kind of see what that might be like and stuff I mean I think if you've got the inclination, um, then you know, absolutely, it's it's a good thing. I mean, if you've got if you've got an interest in in building a product and building a company, um, absolutely, you know, I think absolutely, it's 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 a good thing. I think it comes down to what are the things that you like to do. If you, you know, really enjoy the um, the coding or the product development, and that's kind of where the interest stops, and maybe that's where you want to focus. Or if you also have an interest in you know how it goes out to market and and, you know, just not that you would necessarily need to kind of be the person out there getting customers, but if you have an interest in that part of things as well, you know, maybe that's um, a good indication that starting a business would be kind of the right, the right kind of direction. Yeah, to be honest, I think I'm more into like the coding aspect. So yeah, yeah I'm, just kind of, I'm kind of dabbling and looking, looking at all sides and stuff, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's also, you know, ways you can kind of scratch that, that itch too. I mean, with, uh, you know, there's probably things you could do on the side or things that, you know, if there's things that you wanted to bring to market, unless you've got kind of an idea for something that would be a product that you could build a company on, there's probably different ways that you could kind of explore that as well. 
I don't know if you've done that. Like there's, you know, you could kind of create a product and put it up on different app exchanges or things like that, where you can see, okay, is there, is there something here? Do you like doing that part of things uh, or not? Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. A uh, quick question, Mark, uh, returning to marketing, uh, you, uh, have on your KPIs, um, almost $33,000, uh, for, uh, potentials on referrals and partners, uh, resulting in zero, uh, wins. Uh, can you explain that? Yeah, I think it might've been a, um, it might've even been, it might've either been the period of time or it was, I think one of those things that we just didn't focus on. Like, I think it was one of those, it's one of those, um, areas that was probably under, um, under addressed in my opinion, um, at that stage that that was actually, that that slide was actually pulled from, we were focusing on more of the other things and, um, it, it was, it was also for a particular quarter. So it's just likely that we didn't get anything to close in that quarter. Yes. Uh, it certainly would seem that if you have people that are utilizing your product, uh, that they are, uh, uh, thrilled with it, that, uh, they would recommend it to others and that would lead to new business for you. Yeah. A lot of times it's hard to track that too, right? Cause you know, somebody, you know, I tell you, Hey Marco, check these guys out. It doesn't always come through as, um, like you don't capture that lead source yes mm -hmm. a lot of times so it's it's a pretty imperfect science i think some of these um some of them you can just nail like you know how many leads came through google yeah. definitively this is yeah. one where i think it's a little harder so yes uh, do you have a referral program are people incented to uh provide referrals to you with with the, uh, the the product I'm in the in the process of launching, um, we're just we're we're so new to launching right now that we we will have a referral program, okay. um, but again, it's really leveraging the it, it's gonna it's a, it's a it's a communication platform for nonprofits, and we're going into very kind of you know organization specific, so it's gonna be word of mouth in there. It, it's if it, if it goes well, people are going to be like, you got to use this thing. It's fantastic. If it doesn't go well, it's going to be like, stay away from it. Don't go near it. Yeah. So we're not at the stage of referral program just yet. We'll probably get there, but word of mouth is going to be, mm -hmm. it's going to have a tremendous impact. I think one way or the other. Yes. And I see that uh, those uh, who went through the product demonstration were uh, converted a hundred percent of them. Yeah. Again, I don't know if the numbers were, were uh, yeah, I can't remember what happened that quarter, but you're right, that, that, was, that was always also a good one as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if we don't have any more questions, um, I think we can, we can wrap it up. Pause, wait, no, okay, awesome. Um, well, thanks, Mark, that was, that was a really, Great presentation. And we'll, we will have it up on the website uh, in the next few days. We'll share it. The video will be there. If you don't mind sharing your slides, Mark, I'd love to put those up as well. I'll and send them over, for sure. Yeah, that way anyone, you know, if you want to go back and look at something or if you missed the beginning or wanted to share it with someone, then, um, you know, you can, you can just share the link. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Mark. Mark. Thanks right, for joining bye -bye. us, everyone. Okay, bye.